Welcome. Everything is great. You are listening to Forkin' Bullshirt, the Good Place podcast. I'm Vivian. And I'm Jason. We'll be the architects of your journey into the afterlife. Today we're talking about Season 2, Episode 13, Somewhere Else. This episode is written and directed by Michael Schur. It aired February 1st, 2018. Shall we dive right in? Let's do it. Michael pleads for the humans, arguing that their self-improvement in the afterlife means that the system they use to deem humans good or bad is fundamentally flawed and unreasonable. While Michael speaks to the judge one-on-one, the humans chat. Tahani tells Eleanor about her test, and they share a tender moment. Jason reminisces about one of the craziest years of his life, just before Janet confesses her love for him. Janet's confession sparks a moment of realization for Chidi, and he kisses Eleanor. Okay, so before we get to that part, (laughs) I really love Jen still. She's amazing. When she starts off the episode just being like, oh, love it, major drama, spill the tea, sweetheart, immediately I have to assume that she's a fan of RuPaul's Drag Race. Of course. Yeah. All tea, all shade, right? (laughs) (laughs) And you kind of feel just right off the bat that she's open to listening. Yes. Well, she hasn't had a case in 30 years. She's pretty bored. (laughs) Michael explains to her pretty much exactly what we said last episode. Mm -hmm. That the system is fundamentally flawed. Yes. (laughs) I think he's been listening. I really like that he's not just arguing like, hey, these four humans are special, but that they prove that the system is flawed and that it's very possible millions of people are being tortured for eternity when they shouldn't be. Yeah, he's looking at the bigger picture, and it's it's kind of a huge leap for him. Mm-hmm. He's not just narrowly looking down the microscope at just these four. He's, you know, he's looking around the lab being like, wait, this system is wrong. Yeah. Like, we've been doing this wrong for a long time. Mm-hmm. And I was recently watching an episode of Crash Course Philosophy on what it is to live a good life. And Hank Green said, People who practice philosophy are also simply people who ask why, who are willing to challenge something that doesn't seem right, to listen to other people's opinions, and to be ever ready to accept new truths if the evidence is there. Which just screamed Michael and all the humans to me. Mm -hmm. Like... They're questioning the reality, they're questioning the status quo, and saying, I don't think this is right, and asking, why is it this way, and being ready to accept the possibility of change. And the answer of, well, it's always been this way, is not good enough. Absolutely not! Right, it shouldn't be the answer. Ugh. How do you feel about Tani and Eleanor's little moment? They haven't had a nice one-on-one in a while, so it was nice to see them just... Take a breather, take a moment, and just chat for a few. Yeah. They really haven't had time to do it lately, especially in the last few episodes because it's been such a whirlwind. Mm -hmm. I like it. I think it's a really good moment, but I also feel like it's playing on the relationship that they had in season one and not really the relationship they have as much in season two. Right. We didn't see them connect the same way that they did in the first season. Mm -hmm. So when Tahani says... You know, any progress that I made was because you and I have become mates. That's nice, but I don't really believe that that's true, I Mm. suppose. I would totally believe it if this was coming from season one to Hani. But season two to Hani has spent most of her time with Jason, not with Eleanor. Mm -hmm. Maybe to Hani is more talking about the progress of them getting to where they are and not Mm. necessarily the progress of becoming a good person. Okay. But I totally agree with you because we didn't see her connect with Tahani the same way that she did in season one, coming in and seeing her crying, comforting her, um, helping her deal with the whole Jason Gianyu situation. Mm -hmm. We didn't see any of that. So I'm not sure whether Michael sure is assuming that that's what happened in those gaps of time in season two. Mm -hmm. But it'd be nice if we kind of saw that. Yeah. When I first watched the episode, I just took it at face value and I was like, oh, this is such a sweet moment. And I like that Eleanor Tahani are having like a little bonding time. But then watching it a couple more times, I thought, oh, well, is this really the most recent Tahani and Eleanor we're seeing? Mm -hmm. Anyway, 
still still a good moment. And maybe really Tahani just means that the progress I made is because all of us became friends and we all helped each other. You know, it's not like I did it by myself. Right. So then we have Jason and Janet's reunion. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I like it. It does feel rushed to me. I feel like Jason and Janet just haven't had the same screen time as they did in season one. I know, I'm just complaining about the same thing, but I think it's true. I mean, Janet is remembering her love for Jason from before, but when he responds, I think I love you too, girl, seems a little shallow. And it just kind of feels like Janet is doing this just so that we can have Chidi realize his feelings for Eleanor. So all of these moments of revelation, let's say, Mm -hmm. feel a lot more in tune with their season one storylines and personalities and developments. Yes and no. I don't think Chidi and Eleanor's is that kind of moment. I feel like Chidi and Eleanor's feels really grounded in season two. Now, you said that you think Janet's reacting to her memories of the earlier resets. Well, I think that she's feeling that love that she felt for Jason before, which was affecting her earlier this season. Whether she knows it or not. Yeah. Okay. But now that she is consciously aware of that feeling and she has spent a little bit more time with him, she feels it again. Enough to confess it to him anyway. Mm -hmm. It's possible that a lot of these things are happening because they really believe they're only going to see each other for another few moments. Right. But I feel like this moment's just really more about Janet. I really like that she can explain her feelings really precisely because that's a huge step for her. Mm -hmm. And I like that she says, I'm not just a Janet anymore. I don't know what I am because last episode we were talking about how, or a couple episodes ago, we were talking about how now she's bad Janet slash good Janet slash we don't even know. Mm -hmm. She's surpassing what a Janet really is, so... Absolutely. Yeah, this moment does feel rushed. All their moments feel rushed because they really wanted to get into the storyline. They only have 22 minutes, so it's a little frustrating. Maybe this would have been good as a two-parter episode, an hour long. They could have gotten like 45 minutes or something. I don't know. (laughs) But it's still nice to see her confessing her love for Jason. I liked it a lot. Yeah. And of course, leading into the next moment. Mm Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Oh, man. I was so happy <laughs> when this as, happened. <laughs> as soon as he said, as soon as he had that realization, like, oh, right, that's what I've been doing, the fork and the garbage disposal, oh, you knew exactly what was going to happen. And I could oh, yeah. see you leaning forward and, like, getting all flustered, like, no, 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 this is happening. Yay! <laughs> and I'm pretty sure I just reached over to you and like smacked your leg a bunch of times as it was happening. Uh-huh. And maybe squeed? I don't know. <laughs> I can't remember. I basically blacked out. <laughs> <laughs> basically. So even though I feel like, you know, the whole Jason and Janet thing kind of happened just for Cheaty and Eleanor, I am so damn happy about Cheaty and Eleanor. I'm so happy that Cheaty just makes a decision. And it was very decision-y. It was certainly decision-y. Hot diggity dog it was. There was no hesitation. (laughs) Nope. There was just beeline straight for Eleanor's lips. (laughs) All right, I'm taking the train to Eleanor's lips and I'm not making any stops. Exactly. (laughs) Uh, I, I love it. And I think it's great that he doesn't have like a moment of panic afterwards. Yeah, like, oh my goodness, did I do the right thing? I'm so sorry, let me... No, he's totally calm. He's sure in his decision that he should just go over there, make his feelings so abundantly clear by not even talking about them, just by acting. Mm -hmm. Which is not something we ever see Chidi do. So this is a very special moment. And I really love that a few people on Twitter started mentioning me in their tweets, like, Hey, what about that moment? (laughs) How about that moment? Did Did, you see? Yeah. Did you see? Oh, baby, did I ever. Um, I just love that because, you know, everybody knows that I love them. So that's kind of sweet. Mm -hmm. Made me happy that people were thinking of me while Eleanor and Chidi were kissing. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So moving past that, even though I never really want to move past that. (laughs) 
Michael and Jen propose individual medium places for the four humans, but Eleanor argues this isn't good enough. Jen believes they only improved in the fake good place because they were seeking moral dessert. Michael convinces Jen to give them a push in the right direction, and before they can explain it, Jen snaps her fingers and Eleanor is back outside the grocery store just moments before her death. Okay, let's rewind a little bit. Yep. Go back to moral dessert. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And Chidi asks how long they'd have to be in their medium place. Mm -hmm. Eleanor looks at him like, oh, he's thinking about us and he's thinking about me and he's thinking about the group and... And how long he's going to have to be away from me and my lips. Yep. (laughs) <laughs> it's a very sweet little look that she gives him. Absolutely. Kristen Bell really nailed the aw look. Yeah. Oh, she certainly does. She plays love struck very well. Backing up even a little bit before that, when Jen comes in and she's like, okay, I've got two things. And first, <laughs> she asks them if they want chips and guac and then tells them about the plan. All I could think of was like, Ron Weasley saying she needs to sort out her priorities. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, man. Homemade chips and guac. I mean, it's good. It's homemade. No? No takers? Um, Okay. (laughs) Maya Rudolph is fantastic. I love her. (laughs) Yeah, she is really good. So let me first talk about my own little moment of, oh, wow, I'm dumb. Okay. (laughs) Okay. I'm always a sucker to explain how I just realized something for the first time in my long existence of life. Mm -hmm. I've been doing this or saying this or thinking this wrong for years. Okay. So when someone says, looks like they got their just desserts, it's not desserts. Like, mmm, yummy desserts. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I always thought it was that. So what, you thought like, my, mm, they totally got their just brownies. Well, They're just ice cream sundae. <laughs> they got what they deserved. Like, everyone deserves dessert. Oh my gosh. I know. It's bad. And then I thought, because I was looking it up online, like, just desserts. Why is nothing... Oh, all these things are coming up. Like, people spelling it wrong and people... It's becoming like... A generally accepted spelling error that people make and then i thought when you desert somebody that's just one s even mm. though it's pronounced the same as desert mm. kind of so i just had a really dumb moment and it was or it was like a moment of revelation it was it was pretty interesting no. i was like oh 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 wow <laughs> oh wow Yeah, I'm dumb. (laughs) No, I mean, it it happens to all of us, right? (laughs) So what Jen's talking about here is really divine moral desertism. So will we get some sort of reward from a heavenly figure, uh, like a god, um, for our actions on Earth? Do good, get good. Yeah, which is sort of a criticism of a lot of religions because... People will say, well, are you just being a good person because you think it'll get you into heaven? Mm -hmm. And does that really make you a good person if that's the reason you're doing things? Right. Because you think you're going to get something out of it. So it's not so much about like an earthly moral desertism. It's not about what we deserve here on earth. It's what we deserve in the afterlife. Once our time on earth has been completed and the sum of our actions, the totality of our person has been measured when we get to the pearly gates and saint peter judges us right so there's a lot of talk about desertism in philosophy but i find most of it is concentrated on the treatment that we deserve on earth so discussing what why should we be treated a certain way and You know, should certain things mean that we get treated better, worse, all that kind of thing. So, so for example, the philosopher John Rawls criticized moral desserts because he felt like you shouldn't be treated a certain way because of certain things that are out of your control. So, for example, um, if you're white, okay, if you're a white person, uh, for example, if you're a white male, it doesn't mean that you should be treated any better than anyone else because 
none of that is your own action. You were you didn't choose to be born white and you didn't work hard to be born male, right? right? You just are. And you should not be treated any better for that. Right. Which is to say on the flip side that if you were born, you know, a black female, that you should not be treated any worse, right? Mm -hmm. Or if you're short or, you know, red hair or brown hair or bad eyesight, yeah. whatever. None of that should be a factor in uh, in what you deserve as a person. Mm -hmm. But of course, there's a difference between deserving something and being entitled to something, too. So a lot of people on Earth believe that if you work hard, you deserve good things. Like you deserve a good paycheck and you deserve maybe a raise if you do some really good work. Uh, you deserve to have like a comfortable lifestyle if you work hard. We know that's not true. Whereas if you're lazy, you deserve to be, you know, poor. You deserve to be this, that, whatever. Right. So there's sort of just a a common conception of how you should be treated and what you deserve on earth when you're living here. And also what you deserve in the afterlife because of the life you lived. People will say, well, I hope that guy's burning in hell <laughs> because he was a jerk, mm -hmm. you know, versus I think she's in a better place when someone really wonderful who did so many good things for humanity has passed. Mm -hmm. Do you think that how we're raised has a huge factor in that. Absolutely. I mean, when you're in school, you do good work and you get rewards. When Absolutely. you're at home, you do chores, you get rewards. You, you know, it's, that's just, it's almost like bribery, right? Yeah, it can start to feel that way. Absolutely. We'll say that kind of stuff because we want people to work hard. We want people to, we want our kids to do well in school so that they can get a good job and all this stuff. So we'll tell them exactly that. Well, you need to work hard so you can get a good job, so you can make a lot of money, so you can, you know. There's always another step. There's always some sort of reward that you're getting yeah. for your actions. Now, when it comes to being a good person, I find that we have less to reward ourselves with, at least here on Earth. Because if we tell our kids, like, hey, you should be a good person, treat other people with kindness and respect. If your kid says, well, what am I going to get out of that? Um, kindness and respect back. Maybe just like Eleanor ends up seeing in this episode when she writes that note on someone's windshield. Hey, I bumped your car. Sorry. She gets a lawsuit. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that happens. And how do you convince people to keep doing good things when they're not seeing anything for themselves? Right. Yeah. And Eleanor's biggest flaw is selfishness. She wants to do things because it'll be good for her in some way. So she's got to fight that instinct. So that's a breakdown of moral desertism. <laughs> yeah, a little bit anyway. So I like that Jen points this out. I think it's really important because it's not really something that I was thinking about this whole time. Like, yeah, all of them are acutely aware of the fact that they are going to be tortured for eternity if they don't get better. So they're like really the only choice they have here is to be a better person but they're doing it to get a reward. They're doing it so they can finally, at some point, say, hey, I'm good enough, and I will go to the good place. You know, are they going to keep working on being a good person in the good place? Are they going to revert back to their old ways? Does there have to be a constant threat of them getting sent down to the bad place in order for them to stay there? Yeah, and it's not fair. Other people on Earth had no guarantee that they were going to get, you know, some sort of reward in the afterlife or punishment in the afterlife. We make assumptions based on religion, but we don't actually know. No one has the answer. Mm -hmm. So they're getting like an unfair advantage, basically. So I think really this was amazing. Like, I love that they sent them back to Earth at, to this point where they had no idea. They're on a level playing field with other people. Jen slaps them super hard with a reality check. Like, you guys think you're good people, but this is the reason. Like, you're, you have bait. Like, you're being baited by the good place. So, let's change the, let's even equalize the playing field. Absolutely. So, I think it's genius. And I've seen this theory before. I've seen a lot of people on Reddit, on Twitter, sort of saying, what if they actually just go back to Earth? What if they 
you know, are suddenly alive again, all this kind of stuff. But I didn't really think it was going to happen. I was vehemently against that. Oh, really? And I still am. Oh, okay. But Hmm. not in the way the show has done it. Okay. So. So what were you against? Them going back, getting sent back to before they died and like the moments before and then avoiding it. Just exactly the same way it happened, but for realsies. Because I don't think this is real. Um, I'm in the same boat as a lot of other people who think this is another test. Oh, okay. So if this episode had played out similarly to how it is now, but we didn't have Michael and Janet watching the point totals, we didn't have Michael's intervention. And we didn't know. Like, we didn't know what was going on. Then you'd be... I would be a little upset. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because that would really change the show. Like maybe a little too much. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hmm. I like that the push in the right direction is so literal. <laughs> but it does make me wonder how this is going to work for Jason. Because Tahani was crushed by the statue of her sister. Chidi was crushed by an air conditioner. And Eleanor was smacked into a moving truck. So all of those... You can get you pushed know, out of the way. Absolutely. Jason isn't a safe. Well, he's not going to be in the safe. So he's going to be... So Maybe what, someone's going to be like walking by and be like, hey, bro, that's kind of a dumb idea. Eh, yeah, that doesn't have the same impact. No. Maybe Jason's dying in the safe, uh, suffocating, and someone opens the door last second. Hmm. And it's like, whoa, you almost died, or I don't know. I feel like it's got to be really literal. So I'm thinking maybe Michael pushes the safe over and it pops open. Somehow? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. And she also says there's there will have to be strict rules so the results aren't tainted. I feel like one of the plot points in season three is going to be Jen finding out that Michael intervened mm. again in Eleanor's path. Mm-hmm. And maybe that will bring some sort of punishment onto Michael. Now, we did have a listener, um, Kate, at I Do Human Things, who sort of questioned Jen's reaction to Michael saying that he will probably be punished for eternity as well if things don't work out. And she kind of has this like, oh, like, oh, yeah, I guess you'd be punished too. Hmm. Kind of look on her face. Yeah, I'm not sure whether that's in response to his statement about being punished or whether she's just moved on immediately to, oh, should we do this? Mm -hmm." Okay, fine. Yeah, and she does that, like, dial-up modem yeah, groaning. exactly. <laughs> which is so great. <laughs> I swear, I just want to add, like, a caption that says, like, dial-up modem. Dial-up sounds. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Work. <laughs> bing, bing, bing. Da-dum. Yes, I want a YouTube video mm-hmm. with those sounds over her. The photo of her groaning. Yes, I want that. Um, <laughs> Someone make that for me. Anyway, <laughs> I think it's really important that Michael puts it out there that, hey, yeah, I'm putting myself on the line here too. You know, I really think this is going to work and I'm willing to put my existence on the line. Right. I do think that Michael would end up being punished too. As their advocate, he is responsible. Responsible. All right, so let's go back to Earth. Eleanor, frozen, watches as the row of carts rushes towards her. At the last moment, a man pushes her out of the way, and she watches as the carts ram right into a speeding truck. She almost died. When she returns home, she decides she wants to become a better person. She quits her job, apologizes to the environmentalist, and joins the Clean Energy Crusaders. Back in the judges' quarters, Michael and Janet carefully watch the human's point tally. So we get the engorgulate truck, Mm -hmm. (laughs) which is great. And we get a Camilla ad in the background. Yeah. For an album titled Perfect. Surprise, surprise. And I zoomed in. I took a screenshot and I zoomed in as much as I possibly could. And one of the little lines at the bottom said something like, Probably the best album of all time. Yes. Yes. Which was probably said by like, I don't know, Gandhi. Which is impossible, (laughs) but whatever. (laughs) He, like, resurrected himself just so he could hear Camilla's new album. I'm assuming that's how amazing she is. So this is the the moment that, one of my favorite moments of the episode, I think, of the season, mm. even, is because 
it gives me flashbacks ha 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 to lost <laughs> i know right uh i'm not going to give you any spoilers but it reminds me of the finale of season five and the premiere of season six. Oh yeah where okay. the finale of five you have no idea what's going to happen mm-hmm. the screen goes white season six starts up and you're left thinking wait what what <laughs> what's a, what's about to happen like, this doesn't make any sense i mean that's to be fair, that's pretty much the end of every Lost episode ever. But <laughs> but especially the finale of five leading into six. It was was a very interesting choice. Mm. Especially when you had to wait like six months for the stupid season to start and you're left not knowing what was like, going to happen. Anyway. I'm happy that they didn't do that. That they didn't go the whole episode with Jen and Michael putting ideas forward. They didn't end with Eleanor just eyes open and she's suddenly back on earth that would be frustrating that would be a doozy of a finale that would be a finale but yeah that would be a doozy of a finale for sure but also that'd be like no i don't want to wait eight months for the next damn season i mean i don't want to wait eight months for the next damn season but but... if you left on that type of cliffhanger yes oh i know it's awful oh yeah it's awful (laughs) Uh, watching Lost live was probably the worst experience of your entire life. <laughs> like the best and worst. Oh, absolutely. Because right? <laughs> you get to postulate for months on what the hell was going to happen. Mm-hmm. I really like that it feels like Lost. I mean, a lot of people were comparing it to Lost in season one, and I get why with all the flashbacks, but. And all the eye openings. Yeah. You zoom in on the faces. and Yeah. But we've been doing that more this season. Like the first episode we had Eleanor opening her eyes and being in the good, well, the fake good place. And then we saw Chidi's and Tani's and Jason's. Whereas we didn't get to see that in season one. And now we're going back. We're doing the same thing at the end of the season. Mm-hmm. We're getting Eleanor's eyes open. But now she's in potentially the fake earth, a simulation, a reality. We don't know. Mm-hmm. We'll find out. But yeah, we're coming full circle again, which is really cool. And it just really feels like loss. Like Mm -hmm. we're getting a second chance. We're figuring things out again. And I love it. I think it's great. I think it's such a good move. And then, of course, when she goes back to her apartment, her roommates are playing the the one up game. Oh my god, that's the worst game. If you <sighs> ever like listen to your friends do it, it's so frustrating. Yeah, just or tell if your you friends have to friends. shut up. Yeah, if you have friends that do that. Oh. Yeah. Get new friends. So let me get Eleanor's change and it's quick. It's quick and it's dramatic. You do think so? You... Yeah, I feel like it's pretty pretty quick, it right? It is quick, but I totally buy it. Yeah? Yep. Okay. Why? If if you're in her shoes, you almost die. Like, you literally are split second away from death. Mm-hmm. You want to maybe reevaluate your life. Yeah. And think, holy crap, if I just died there, would I have... I mean, if heaven and hell were real, like, would I be burning in hell right now? Hmm. See, I'm coming at it from a different angle. Hmm. Where, yeah, you want to reevaluate your life, but more like you look at it and think... Well, if I had died at that moment, would I have felt like I lived a good life? Okay, that's fair too. Yeah. And I think that was a great moment for her to say, my life was kind of awful. I'm kind of a jerk. Yeah. So I can can see where she's coming from. Maybe we just didn't see that as clearly. Hmm. Well, we do know that Eleanor has always had that little voice in the back of her head. Mm Mm-hmm. We know that it's there and it's telling her, you know, you know this is wrong. You know you shouldn't be doing this. But out of laziness, out of selfishness, she still goes ahead and does it. Right. I don't know. Um, I think the change that's a little bit more dramatic for me, like, yeah, sure. You look at your room and you're like, oh, I'm a slob. I should clean up. You know, I should make an effort to be tidier, that kind of thing. I should conserve. I should donate my things. I don't think that's... I feel like that's that's totally reasonable. It's like, okay, I buy that. I don't think that's what she's doing. No, no, no. But what I'm saying is the part that I don't really buy as much is her joining like the clean energy crusaders. Because we're seeing Eleanor and it's really hard to take apart, you know, what we've seen from season two of her in the afterlife 
versus who she was on Earth. Like, Mm -hmm. she was a crummy person, right? So I guess I can see how some people might be like, well, the Eleanor on Earth, if this is not a simulation, if this is really just her on Earth, she hasn't had any of these life-changing things other than the near-death experience. And would that really lead her to, like, start this whole chain of being good for six months? Mm Mm-hmm. I don't know. Obviously, she's seeking someone who can help her, just like she sought Chidi out. But I guess I just feel like it's a lot. It's a lot that happens in one episode, I think. Absolutely. 100%. Yeah. I totally buy it, though, because her process, I think, is... Okay, let's start with the easy things. Mm -hmm. I'm going to start small. My room. I want to feel like a better person. I can't feel good in my room. Let's do that. Next, I'm kind of a jerk to people. Let's start to apologize. And and then she makes the bigger step of quitting her job. But mm-hmm. I think before she quits her job, she's thinking like, this job is terrible. Mm-hmm. I'm doing bad things. But it's also my source of income, so I need to get a new job. And hey, the guy that I'm a jerk to all the time, maybe I can ease my way in there because it's more convenient. And it's easier than going to look for a job because he could offer one like immediately. Oh, okay. So it might be more of a convenience thing. Uh, yeah, well, that's very possible. I mean, it is a job. And she's so, like, out of tune with the world, I think, at this point. Mm -hmm. She's been so self-absorbed that she thinks in order to be a good person, you have to have a boner for the environment. (laughs) So, and, like, goes all the way, like, become vegetarian and everything. So immediately she's like, well, I can get a job helping the environment because that's obviously what good people do Mm -hmm. so oh good people are vegetarians so i'll become a vegetarian yeah this is just what she's thinking okay these are like hey it's like a list of of things that good people do and i'll just pick the ones that i can manage right right okay interesting i think if eleanor hadn't died and hadn't been given a push in like the right direction she likely would have been charged with fraud because that's what the guy's saying when she goes to quit, right? Like, yeah. we're being investigated for fraud. Everyone's going down. So good timing on you. So just like Jason, if he doesn't get out of the safe fast enough or if we don't figure out something, he's likely going to be charged. Yeah. With potentially theft, robbery. I don't know. It's not armed robbery. There's no guns, but mm-hmm. yeah. So let's talk a little bit about Michael and Janet looking at the points. Yes. Their little morality ticker, which is like a, a stock ticker. Oh, from okay. Back in the, the 20s. That's. I was wondering what they were trying to be like. When I didn't get it. When you're as old as I am, you kind of uh, grow up in the age of stock tickers. Right. Yeah. Because yeah. you're like a thousand. Yeah. <laughs> so they're, they're, st- they're, they're stock tickers. Basically, um, but they and stock tickers, if you're unaware of how it worked, is basically people send information through the telegraph, through like a telephone line to the little machine, which would tell people the prices oh. of, of stocks. So they were able to get quote unquote real time information back in like the 20s, mm. but it would still take a while. So, you know, yeah, they could get their information like within a day. Oh, okay. Instead of like to the minute. Mm. And just a little bit of information. If you've ever heard the term ticker tape parade. Oh. The ticker tape was stock ticker tape. Oh. Which was when a stock ticker had gone through all its tape and all the information's there. It gets chopped mm. up and turned into confetti. Oh. So that's where all the ticker tape comes from. Oh, cool. Yeah. Huh. I didn't know that. Did you notice that? Eleanor and Jason had different tickers than Chidi and Tahani. I didn't. Yeah, they're slightly different looking, which I wonder why. I'm wondering if it's maybe because Chidi and Tahani were already like pretty good, you know, doing good things, but maybe like not with the right intentions or like not with the right consequences. Maybe every I don't know device is different for every person. Yeah, no, it. Eleanor and Jason had the same one, and then mm. Tahani and Chidi did. It might not mean anything. It might just be artistic choice because, you know, it was Chidi and then Eleanor and then Tahani and Jason, so they just wanted to have 
you know, some sort of difference, mm-hmm. but could be a clue. You mm-hmm. never know. I'm picking up on the littlest things here. That's what we do on Fork and Bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> and speaking of that, the song during the montage of Eleanor becoming a better person um, has some very poignant lyrics. The song is Maybe by the Submarines. And in this first section, um, the lyrics are, There's a sign among the remnants of all our words best left unsaid. And when the truth flies in our direction, do we work it through or lose our heads? Maybe, maybe, maybe we're strong, but maybe, maybe, maybe we're wrong. And I think that's great. Like, the truth of her existence literally flies in her direction the moment she's pushed out of the way. She knows my life isn't good. I'm not a good person right now. (laughs) And do we work it through? Like, do we try to be better or do we just, meh, screw it, whatever, leave it? Mm Mm-hmm. And then saying here, like, maybe we're strong, like, maybe she's strong enough to do this. And maybe I've been wrong in the past. I mean, it's a little on the nose, but I like it. I think it's great. We've had evidence in the past that the song choices are Mm -hmm. very on the nose with the situation that's going on. So it's it's very believable. Yeah, just like Green Light by Lord in the episode with the scale that turns green. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And also the Frank Sinatra song in the second last episode of season one, I believe, when Eleanor is shopping and it's the, and now we've reached the final curtain. Yeah. And now the end is near. near And And then that's when we see Eleanor actually getting hit by the carts. Mm -hmm, Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. On the nose, but still good. Yes. Yes, definitely. I really like the, the montage that's going on. Mm Mm-hmm. It's really obvious that Eleanor is not only becoming a better person she's finding it easier to get her to bed she's smiling more she's just overall being a happier person Mm -hmm. and it's really clear yeah yeah we see her actually like interacting kindly with people and smiling at people which is just not something she was doing before Mm -hmm. she was always just sort of scowling and you know calling people dong bait and dummy and yeah and you see it's an actual effort for her to do this because Mm -hmm. she still slips a few times like do you want to chew on my ass assortment of brownies (laughs) which was a great save by the way yeah excellent nobody would have noticed that (laughs) i love the reaction from the co-worker too like uh yes (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> like it's an interesting thing to say but okay was not expecting that response from uh, eleanor <laughs> mm-hmm. and then it juxtaposed with the next part which we will get into right now while out for dinner with her roommates eleanor finally confesses to her involvement with the dress bitch scandal consequently she has to find a new place to live she begins to struggle less engaged at work and living like a slob again she leaves a note after bumping a car in a parking lot and is rewarded with a lawsuit. So her roommate's reaction is hilarious. It's almost like she's like dancing when she yells at them. She really needs to like gear up for every moment. So when you watch that scene again, just like notice her body movement. It's when Brittany's saying fantastic. like you guys need to like you're horrible hogs. Yeah, yeah. She's like, you guys are a bunch of hogs and I want you to move out of my apartment right now. Like, everything just takes so much effort that she's got to, like, actually launch it out of her body. Right. It's amazing. She is. That's a great way to say it. She's propelling it. She's just, like, she's attacking them with these word bombs. Yeah. That she's just chucking at them. She is physically assaulting my eyes with that movement. (laughs) It's great, though. I just can't help. But laugh at that point, though. Like, I know it's supposed to be like, oh, my gosh, it's dramatic. Like, poor Eleanor is going to have to find another place to live. It's just too funny. Yeah. Yeah. And Um, I think at this point, the writers must have, like, a little inside joke. Because I'm sure they're trying to find a way to stick in the mm -hmm. word literally every episode. Yeah. (laughs) And the way she says it. It's like, you're both disgusting hogs. And I want you to move out of my apartment forever. Literally starting right now. (laughs) They must have seen the subreddit where many people have commented on how many times they say literally. Yeah, they're like, well, let's just squeeze it out every episode. We can do it. 
I really think that it's just Michael Schur reliving his love for how Chris Traeger says literally all the time. <laughs> so it's a Michael Schur thing. I think so. Yeah. I do. So all the writers have like a little post-it on their computer that's like, it just says literally. Yeah. And I... so every time the writers just are stumped on a line, they look at that post-it and they're like, mm, I know what to do now. Literally. Thanks, Michael. I literally know what to do now. Yeah. <laughs> I'm assuming it's just like a cutout of Chris Traeger doing the finger guns, because he does that a lot, with the caption literally underneath. Okay, I like it. Yeah. And if that's not in the writer's room or on every writer's desk, then it should be. So write that down. <laughs> Make a note. Literally, write it down right now. <laughs> and then we get the lyrics again. Yeah, the when, second montage. Yep. Yeah, when Eleanor's struggling and the lyrics are... For such a long time now, we're doing battle with our own familiar inhibitions. Far away from home, our trusty compass fails to find the strange in the new position. Can we leave this struggle behind? Mm -hmm. It's good. They did a good job cutting this one, for sure. So for such a long time now, like, she's been trying to do this for six months at this point, And she's trying so hard to just fight against that impulse. But she's losing that battle right now. Mm -hmm. And... This whole thing about our trusty compass and we're far away from home just makes you think about how she's not with the people she should be with, right? Mm -hmm. She's not with Chidi. She's not with Tahani or Jason or Michael. And being removed from them makes it so much easier to just slip right back into her old patterns. Yeah. It's like a classic story of... Your old childhood friend comes to visit you and you fall into your old patterns. Yeah. Now, I was thinking a lot about this and part of me believes Eleanor finds it a lot easier to be a jerk because she gets reactions. She gets not satisfaction, but she gets her reward, quote unquote, mm -hmm. which is people's reactions. So she actually gets evidence of what she's doing. Yeah. She gets... Whether it's, even though it's not the best. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's it's basically because people react more to a bad person than they do a good person. Mm. So you do good deeds, you're more likely to go unnoticed. You do crappy deeds, people are going to remember you. People are going to point it out. They're going to be vocal about it. That's very true. Yeah. And it's very possible that Eleanor learned that as a child because a lot of kids do that. They try to get attention, even if it's negative attention. They don't care as long as it's something. Exactly. And I see it all the time with a lot of the youth that I work with now. I see them doing that. They want attention, so they'll say something outrageous. They'll say something offensive. Just they'll to get a reaction. They'll do something stupid and dangerous because they just want someone to pay attention to them. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't think about that. I think it's also just really easy for her to slip back into her patterns because she's spending so much time with these vapid friends. And I was uh, recently watching an episode of The Passion of the Nerds Angel Guide. Um, you should check it out, by the way. He does Buffy guides, angel guides, and he's super smart. Really, really cool. The host, Ian, said something that reminded me so much of Eleanor. He said, how can we be redeemed when the driving impulse is always present inside us? We surround ourselves with other people who are like us because agreement feels good. We want to feel right, so we surround ourselves with people that share our tastes, beliefs, and habits, and our addictions, too. So when we discover a part of us we want to change, often our environment won't let us. The people around us are our mirrors of our best and worst selves. So in so, order to change, you need to change your environment. Yeah. And it's so true. You see it a lot with people struggling with addiction, they'll want to suddenly get sober, but the people around them will try to drag them back because maybe they feel offended. Like, oh, you think you're better than me now? Or, you know, it's just easier because they want to keep those friends in their lives. And if they're not drinking or if they're not using, then those people aren't going to want to be around them. Yeah. You really need to make changes to your environment. Like Eleanor does to an extent. She does get that new job. So that's good. She should have found her own apartment right away and should have stopped hanging out with them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but 
but clearly, you know, it was convenient. They'd been friends with lo- for a long time, so eh, what the heck, I'll keep hanging out with them. I mean, her friends mock her when she makes that public announcement on Facebook. One of her friends says, "Has you have you been hacked? And then they're super judgmental, like, Ugh, why would you want to be a vegetarian? Is it because of the little animals and we stick them in cages? Like, they're super judgmental when they, she says something that honestly won't affect them at all. Mm-hmm. And man, can I ever relate to that? Because I swear, whenever I tell someone that I'm a vegetarian, for the first time, they'll be like, oh, oh. And they start to wonder, like, are you going to make me a vegetarian? Are you going to, like, get mad if I eat meat in front of you? Like, there's Mm -hmm. so many questions about themselves. And sometimes people will take it as, like, a personal attack. So they'll start defending themselves. Like, oh, well, I don't eat that much meat. Or, oh, well, I only eat, like, red meat. Like, sometimes. But, you know. I try to buy organic. Yeah, or something like that. Or, oh, well, I only buy from a local farm. Whatever. Like, dude, I didn't tell you because I'm trying to shame you. Mm -hmm. I didn't tell you so that you could, like, explain to me why you're not one. Like, I'm just telling you because, hey, I want to go out to dinner with you guys and I need it to be a place that has something that I can eat. Mm -hmm. Because that's just how I am about my lifestyle choices. But anyway, I just think... These people are monsters. <laughs> and uh, and I think she would have done a lot better with other people around. Yeah. For sure. Agreed. And it's it's interesting, too, because, like, obviously, Brittany's got the same kind of idea in her mind. And then when Eleanor says, well, I'm trying to be a good person, she's like, well, how's that working out for you? And that's, that's the key point right there. Yeah. That's what this episode is all about. Mm-hmm. She's super focused on what Eleanor is supposed to be getting out of being a good person. Like, you should only do good things if you're rewarded with good things. That's not reality. Mm -hmm. And that's a super selfish way to look at life. I really like the staging of the scene when they're at the restaurant. Mm. Um, Eleanor is on her own and her two friends across the table. I'm not sure whether it was just more convenient to have her friends facing the camera or not. But Mm. it just felt like they were ganging up on her. Right. She felt very isolated. Yeah. Because of her new lifestyle choice. Mm -hmm. She's also kind of slouched in her chair. Like, I think she... I think she knows. Yeah. She knows she needs new friends, but... It's hard to make new friends. Yeah. Yeah. Shall we continue? Let's move on. Michael is frustrated by Eleanor's point tally. Eleanor returns to her old ways. She misses work blows off her co-worker to go see Taylor Splift, a Taylor Swift reggae cover band, and she returns to her shady job. Michael is frustrated by the obvious problem. Reverting back to her old ways. Oh, yeah. She's reading Celebrity Baby Plastic Surgery Disasters, the exact same magazine she was reading while waiting in the checkout uh, line at the grocery store last season. And last she's year. <laughs> back at Andy's Coffee. Yep. And last year, the the magazine featured an ad for Glide, a perfume by Dennis Feinstein, who is uh, a character from Parks and Rec. Yeah, I think you mentioned that in uh, that episode. And the cool thing is that the same actor who played Dennis Feinstein ended up being on this show playing Derek. So this time, the magazine features an ad for Champagne by John Ralphio who is another character from Parks and Rec. And the tagline on the ad is, Turn that frizz down upside dizzy. So I love it. And I have to say, I wonder if Ben Schwartz, who plays John Ralphio, is going to end up being on the show next season. I'm just saying, make it happen. Because yes, 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 please. I want him on the show. And also, I want to point out just some of the little lines on the magazine cover. Because they're, oh my god, they're so bad. Maverick's Three million dollar makeover from fugly to worse. And Maverick's name is spelled awful. Oh, so bad. It's spelled M-H-A-R-Y-C-K. So it's Merrick? Merrick, Maverick, I don't know. There's no V. Okay, yeah. Well then, (laughs) it's Merrick. So bad. (laughs) Whatever. I guess I just assumed there was a V in there because it was just such a god-awful name. Because you're self-centered. It's got to be a V in everyone's name. Oh, yeah, yeah. My name is now Javen. Yeah, of course. Hasn't it always been? (laughs) And there's also another line at the top that says, 
Trayson and Trayden, two twins tout tummy tucks. Oh my gosh, and the names are also terrible. Yeah, Trayson with two Ys and Trayden with three Ys? <laughs> three very unnecessary Ys. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Please name your children something not anywhere near that. Don't name your kids Trayden and Trayson ironically. Or Merrick or- written... In the stupidest way possible. Yeah. Yeah. I really like the joke that Eleanor's friend is like weirdly attracted to that uh, clean energy solution guy. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Just when she's like, oh, yeah, I want to feed him soup. (laughs) Such a weird line, but I like it. (laughs) She does it so perfectly. Like that actress. Yeah, she's playing a horrible person. But her facial expressions are so good that I just want her in more shows. Like, she's just very exaggerated, but in a really fun way. Mm -hmm. Um, And the way she says, oh, I want to feed him soup. And she just pops that pee. It's great. Soup. Yep. (laughs) And, of course, he's called Benedict Cumberbatch. And, I mean, the resemblance is obvious. What was uh, Benedict Cumberbatch's... Benadryl slumber patch or something? Benadryl slumber party. (laughs) (laughs) That's my favorite. So a lot of people on Reddit were, you know, mixing up his name and then that was Jason's favorite. (laughs) Benadryl slumber party. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Okay. One was like (sighs) Benadryl cucumber bun or something. Oh my goodness. Benalin... Yeah, I don't know. There, there's some. There's a great list. Go find it. I don't have a whole lot to say about this part. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's disappointing, but expected. Yeah. Drunk and celebrating her birthday, Eleanor orders a drink at a bar. The bartender turns out to be Michael. She reminisces about the past year, and Michael listens and offers advice. Just as she's about to head home, he leaves her with a question. What do we owe to each other? So another example of how Brittany is a crummy friend... She ditches Eleanor on her birthday, and she's a mistress. Yeah. I so, mean, yeah. I guess it's not really surprising. No, but I mean, what kind of friend ditches their buddy on their birthday? Like, all right, well, peace. Yeah. Nuh-uh. And then we have the poster in the bar, which is right behind them as they come in. And it says, redeem yourself. You are your biggest cash prize. And there's a big drawing of a plane right in the middle. It's very much hitting on the moral dessert, which we're hitting on a lot this episode. And it's kind of a hint that Eleanor is going to take a trip soon, right? Hop on a plane. Go to Australia. Woo! Another lost type thing. And the bar is named Sting's Desert (laughs) Rosé, which is cute. And of course, we get... Dessert, desert, because moral dessert is actually written like desert. Yeah. So. I think we discussed this earlier on in the episode. Yes, Where we did. I had my dumb moment. Yes. But that was like an hour ago, so. Yeah. They might have forgotten by now. Yeah. <laughs> so I really like this scene. I think it's a lot of fun. And of course, we're getting that like, oh my gosh, Ted Danson cheers flashback moment when he turns out to be the bartender, which is cute. I like it. I've never watched Cheers, but I know that he was the bartender. Yeah. I never watched a full episode, but I'm aware of Cheers and sort of basic ideas of, like, the story. So I'm assuming this whole sequence of Michael, his mannerisms, what he's doing, are exactly what he did on Cheers. Mm, Cutting up lemons or limes, whatever, with the the washcloth on the shoulder. and Oh, yeah. You I'm sure it. even the the outfit is similar. Oh, yeah, it is. Okay. Yeah. He wore a lot of checkered shirts, I'm pretty sure. So. Okay. Yeah. I just really like this moment. I think it's great that Michael... I mean, it's not great because he shouldn't be intervening, technically. But I love that he cares so much. And he really wants to give Eleanor, like, another little push. He sees that the problem is that she's not with the people she should be with. Mm-hmm. And he's like, uh, this is a solvable problem. If she actually does get to see Chidi, if she does get to see Tahani and Jason, like, she can improve. And I think she will, so I'm going to give her that little push so that she'll find Chidi. And it's not 
unheard of. Like everybody needs a little help from someone. Yeah. If they're stumbling and he can see that Eleanor is kind of slipping and it's easy to just help somebody. It could be the smallest little thing you can do for a friend or family member or whatever to put them back on track. Yeah, we're not in this alone. Yeah, so it's not totally bad of Michael doing what he's doing, even though he is interfering, but yes, the rules are wrong. Jen's rules are flawed. Ah, okay. All righty. I also just love drunk Eleanor. So mm-hmm. when she's saying stuff like, I was a good person for six months. That's like five years. <laughs> That's like something Jason would say. Yeah, but it's such a good moment. She's super hammered and she's just like, it was like forever. Yeah. Like literally forever. So I should get rewarded for that. Mm-hmm. And I love that we're doing a little callback here when she says, if I'm not going to get rewarded with a tiara or a diagonal award belt, then why even bother? Right? Hey, that's like season two, episode one. Yeah. When she gets the best person sash and she gets the tiara. And I, I love that moment, too, because it shows how Michael and Eleanor are so similar because Michael uses that as a way to torture her. But Eleanor actually wants that. Mm hmm. Like, she wants something that's going to be like, hey, I'm amazing. Reward me for it. Yeah. And the only reason it's torture is because she knows she doesn't deserve it. (laughs) Yeah. And being the center of attention for the wrong reasons. Yes. Eleanor and Michael are just, you know, two peas in a pod or two pickles in a pickle party. Yeah, exactly. Pickle party line? What? No. Uh, Anyway, I love it. I just think drunk Eleanor is hilarious and I would totally want to hang out with her. Mm Mm-hmm. If she's going to say pickle party things, then sure. Let's go hang out. I don't like pickles, but I like you saying pickle party. And of course, her response to what do we owe each other is fantastic when she's like, wait a minute. Did I give you a drink? Am I a bartender now? (laughs) She's so great. Three sheets to the wind. And I love that that's the line he really calls out because that is the book that Eleanor used like ripped the page out of and wrote her note on Mm -hmm. um tm scanlon's what we owe each other that was the book in the finale of season one yeah and at the beginning of season two she has that note she's looking for chidi and now this is michael say like it's really fine chidi basically he's giving her that note again so let's get to the end of our episode sure michael exits a room sneakily returning to the point tallies The next day, Eleanor wakes up with a hangover and checks her computer. After seeing her Facebook post from a year ago, when she said she was going to try to be a better person, she Googles, what do we owe to each other? From here, Eleanor finds a YouTube video of Chidi discussing contractualism. Eleanor takes a plane to Sydney, Australia to visit St. John's University. It's there that she finds Chidi. We return to Michael, who smiles and says, Okay, here we go. And our episode ends. So um, you noticed uh, you noticed some of her other Google suggestions? I did. Um, she apparently has already Googled wedding fail bride farts, wedding fail nip slips, what's a good excuse to skip baby shower, and what do we have to do to impeach? <laughs> so those are very different. <laughs> yes, they are. Um, but... Also very Eleanor, Mm -hmm. you know? The last one, maybe a little less Eleanor. Maybe more Eleanor during the six months of good behavior. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) So just based on what we hear from Chidi's lecture, to me it seems like he's become more decisive. I mean, if we're going with the idea that either everybody is having the simulation at the same time or this is just reality, then it's been a year for Chidi as well. Mm Mm-hmm. I'm assuming. I don't know. I don't actually know how that works. Like, if they didn't all die on the same day. Anyway. Yeah, we're not sure. I assume that the same amount of time has passed. I just... He seems like such a good teacher in Mm -hmm. this video. And... Not boring. No, not at all. Because he's talking in a way that makes Eleanor want to listen. Yeah, exactly. You can see she's really captivated by the entire video. Mm -hmm. There's no way Eleanor would listen to old cheaty like unsure of himself going on for four hours on a topic that should only take half an hour Mm -hmm. like 
we can really tell you're absolutely right that it is a changed chidi. Yeah, and I don't think that the chidi from a year ago, from prior to the push in the right direction, would have been the type of person who would have even done one of these lectures. And I really like that he just hits on a lot of the stuff that makes so much sense to her. Like the voice that warns us when we're doing things that don't feel good or right. Of course, that immediately connects with Eleanor. And then when he says, why choose to be good every day when there's no guaranteed reward here or in the afterlife? I argue that we choose to be good because of our bonds with other people and our innate desire to treat them with dignity. Simply put, we are not in this alone. Mm -hmm. Which just hits on like the theme of the show, I find, because no one on this show gets better on their own. Right. Chidi, yeah, he was a moral person. But he needed someone like Eleanor to show him how to be decisive and to show him how that he could be, you know, a little bit selfish about his own happiness. Like, she made him a better person. And Tahani and Jason, like, they all became better because they were together. Yeah. And that's a really important message, I think, to put out there, too. To surround yourself with good people and to know that you're not fighting on your own. You know, everyone's fighting with you. Yep. Mm -hmm. Don't forget that. Yeah. So, hell yes, Chidi. You're doing great. You're doing amazing. I'm proud of you. I love you. (laughs) Anyway. She gets on the plane. Mm -hmm. I wish it was Oceanic Airlines. I know! They They missed a golden opportunity. They should have done it. I don't know. Maybe they would have had to pay rights to somebody for that, though. It's not a real airline. I know, I but know, it was on but, a show. I know, different so. network. Of course, I also really love this because Chidi said in Best Self, you know, I wish we could have met like normal people meet, like at a philosophy conference or if you came to my office asking for help with philosophy, which, hello, this is exactly what happened. So I guess Eleanor has been proven wrong. Because yeah. this is how real people meet. Yeah. Such a great line in that episode. <laughs> you think, oh my gosh, Chidi is so out of it when it comes to meeting people. And then here we are. Yeah. This is a situation that is somewhat believable. Yeah. You got to meet like normal people. Yep. Let's see if you fall in love this time. Spoiler alert. You totally will. <laughs> <laughs> um... And then we get Eleanor messing up his name again. Of course. Chidi Anna Kendrick, which is a little bit better than Chidi Ariana Grande. Why is it better? Only because the Ariana was not close to Anna. Okay. Anna so we've got a couple more letters. Yeah, we're, we're getting there. We're, we're making our way. way. Up to it. Yeah. Um, I, it could have been funny if she was like, Chidi Anna Gone Girl, you know? Yep. She, she could have come up with a lot. I'm sure they had like a whole list, but... Really, it's not great. Eleanor should be able to say his damn name. Mm -hmm. I do kind of hope that they have some sort of reference to Anna Kendrick in the following (laughs) episodes. Just like a movie that she was in, like a poster or something like that. Because in the first episode of season one, when Eleanor made that comment about Ariana Grande, she started playing just like... On the, I don't know, neighborhood speakers Mm -hmm. during the disaster sequence. So, you know, just add it in there. Just put like a pitch perfect um, poster. Doesn't Jason have an Ariana Grande poster in his butthole? He did. Yeah, he did. They're going to have to keep the Anna Kendrick thing going. Okay. You know, pitch perfect poster here, a song there. So do we want to squash some internet frustrations (laughs) at this point? Right. Um, Yeah, sure. Let's go for it. Let's dive right into the Chidi speaking English. Yes. Because this is not the biggest problem I have with this show. This is a minor problem, and I don't even think it's a problem. People are frustrated that Chidi is speaking English, no accent, in Australia. Because in the first episode of the series, he said to Eleanor, Oh, I'm actually speaking French right now. This place just translates whatever you're saying into the language that's like best understood. Right. So the assumption is that if the show were in Chidi's perspective, then we would hear everybody speaking in French. Eleanor, Michael, Jason, Tahani, etc. Mm-hmm. So everybody is speaking French 
for cheating. Yeah. Which is great, but I think you brought up that uh, there were a few situations where that would not translate. Like mm-hmm. uh, when Chidi is doing his rap about ethics, that would not translate in French the same way. The rhyming scheme would be off. So that just doesn't make sense. Yeah. So the idea is that was a great idea that they brought up in the first season. Mm-hmm. They kind of forgot about it or not forgot about it, but just like dismissed it. Like this isn't a big deal. Yeah. Let's not pursue this because who cares? And I think there's definitely room for him to just be bilingual. Yeah, absolutely. And I know that a lot of people are saying he should at least have an accent. Yeah, but I think because the show is likely going to keep them in this reality or simulation for a while, that it would be really distracting to hear William Jackson Harper with like this tacked on accent. Yeah, exactly. And I think people would have more issue with it if that were the case. Mm -hmm. People would be like, oh, what's with the accent? And why isn't he blah, 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 blah. And then just be this whole headache. And just he's bilingual. He's mentioned he taught in Australia before. So we can assume that he speaks English. Yeah. And we have seen him in flashbacks speaking to, you know, his buddy in English. Yeah. It's very likely that he can speak English without a thick accent as well yeah so i mean i get it i totally get it i mean this entire podcast is us nitpicking about stuff that's what we do but i think after seeing it for the 500th time i just started to feel like all right guys i'm bilingual and i don't have an accent in either language so it happens i mean but when you speak french you have an accent yeah but when Chidi speaks French, I'm sure he has an accent. No, I know. I'm just saying, like, if I speak, if I'm speaking English, most people have no idea that I speak French. Right. You don't have, like, a Jean Chrétien. Oh, <laughs> that was my, I, I can't I don't have do a it. Céline Dion accent or a Jean Chrétien accent. No, I don't. Yeah, it's so. I just have the, like, French-Canadian accent, which right. is fine, because that's what I am. Yeah. Anyway, point is. I think we can very reasonably find an explanation for this. So I don't think it breaks the world is what I'm saying. Definitely not. So overall, Jason, what did you think of this finale? I liked it as a great episode. I did not like it as a finale. Why? Because it didn't feel like a finale. I don't know. It felt like the beginning of a two-parter. I don't know. It, It also, it felt so centered on Eleanor Mm. that I missed everybody else and a great finale to me includes everybody like no I agree with you that's actually the complaint I was gonna bring up is that we're so focused on Eleanor that I started to feel like okay well are we gonna see Chidi or what's going on with Tahani but what about Jason like I started wondering that after realizing oh we're not going to the others oh okay So in your mind, what I proposed earlier with, like, the end being Eleanor's eyes popping open, like, you would have preferred that? That's a season finale. Okay. It would have sucked. Because it would have left us on, like, a a game changer, not necessarily a cliffhanger? Yes. It would have done what season one did Mm -hmm. and kind of changed the world. We wouldn't have known the extent of it. Mm Mm-hmm. Like, we still don't really know whether it's a simulation or a reality. I'm 90% sure it's a simulation. Okay. But that would have felt like more of a finale. And it would also given us a bit more time to deal with everybody else. Mm, okay. I don't know. it Because the first break of the show, the first like 10 minutes or the first like five minutes even, it just felt really rushed. Mm. I wouldn't have liked another bottle episode. <laughs> first episode or like the finale being all of them in Jen's office just chatting for 25 minutes yeah but I don't know I, I was a little let down I liked it a lot but I feel like it could have been something else okay and it's also really hard to top season one finale I do like that regardless it shows that being a good person um takes a lot of hard work it's not just you make one decision and the rest of your life is easy. You're making those choices every day, all day long. And it's it's hard. It's not always easy to make the good, like the 
right choice. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you want to make the choice that's easy but selfish. And or sometimes you don't know what the right choice is. Yeah, that's very true. Sometimes you're just stuck and confused. So, reality versus simulation. Um, yeah, I I don't know where I land on that. I think it would make more sense logistically for it to be a simulation. Like, if they literally had Eleanor and Chidi and Tahani and Jason, like, strapped to these machines that just make them think, oh, I'm back on Earth and they're making the choices. Because that actually really reminds me of a thought experiment that uh, philosopher Robert Nozick brought up called the experience machine. So he asked us to imagine this machine that could give us whatever desirable or pleasurable experiences we could want. So it's like virtual reality is the idea. Like you put on this machine and then you just experience the life that you want to have. And somehow your body is just being taken care of and you're not really experiencing these things, but your mind is. So basically we wouldn't be able to tell if what we were doing was real or was a simulation. And the thought experiment was kind of to criticize hedonism, but also just to ask us, like, if given the choice, would we prefer the machine to real life? Mm -hmm. So it's like the matrix. Yeah. it, It makes me think of that. Like, of course we're not getting like just the pleasurable moments because Eleanor is struggling and it's not just like life is amazing, but it made me think of that. So it would be interesting to see it that way. I think that would be cool. But also having it be real adds like a whole other, I think, dimension to it. Like it feels like the stakes are higher somehow. Like if it really is real. That would just be messing with life on Earth, which I feel like would be against the rules because you're changing everything from the moment that they died forward so you're changing people's reactions you're changing the person who saved her they have a new experience the the -hmm. guy the crusader just witnessed somebody dying and his life gets changed and like there's a lot of repercussions to it being reality that's true and the whole butterfly flaps its wings exactly you've just created an alternate uh, you've just split the multiverse oh my goodness yeah okay so I think the stakes are too high for it to be real. I don't think right. the higher ups, the CEO, would approve. Mm. Okay, so Jen's boss. Yeah. Do you think she's really running it by anybody? I don't know where she is at this point. Yeah, I know. She kind of disappears. Do you think she, maybe she's discussing it with her boss? Be like, hey, this is what's going on. I just got to check up on you and let you know what's going down. Maybe. It's Here's very possible. My, here are the minutes. She's with the board of directors. Right. For sure. It's very possible. The board of Janets. The board of Janets. No. Anyway. Yeah. So it's an interesting idea of what could be and might be mm-hmm. for season three. So, oh man. Yeah. Um, You're so right. Like if they actually went back and made it so that those four people don't die, life changes for everybody around them. Yeah. That's big. That's really big. Yeah. Okay. I think I'm in camp simulation then. Mm-hmm. All right. Hmm. Plus, it would be interesting to just see their reaction. Like, or I wonder how that would pan out. Like, if it's literally just them sitting in chairs strapped to like a virtual reality system type of thing, are they going to feel very differently when they get unstrapped to that? Yeah. Yeah. Are they going to be like, oh... Well, that wasn't my life then? Yeah, like... Does it still count now? Because am I really the same person? I don't know. Yes. Anyway, those are questions for season three. So it's very similar to the the Roy simulation in Rick and Morty, where Morty straps himself into Roy and lives a whole life mm-hmm. inside this simulation. And it's it's only been minutes for him in, in the arcade, when mm-hmm. it's been like 40, 50, 60 years in Roy. Yeah. So you wake up with all these life-changing events and you've had experiences, you're changed, but mm-hmm. then you wake up and like, are you changed? Yeah. As none soon as of you that realize happened. that was a simulation, does that negate all the things that you went through? Mm-hmm. So it's, that's a terrifying thought. 
I'm very interested to see what season three will bring because that will definitely give us something to talk about. Oh, hell yeah. (laughs) I mean, not that we haven't talked long enough, but... So now that we've talked for an eternity, should we dive into the mailbag to uh, make this a little bit longer? We should. Here's the quickest song in the world because we're going to dive into the mailbag. So here's your mail and we're going to answer your stuff. So yay, (laughs) ta-da! I really hope you guys enjoyed that because it was really fun to watch. (laughs) <laughs> We're not going to use that. No, come on, let's use it. <laughs> Our first bit of mail comes from Sarah at Steltsy1. She says, love the podcast. Can't wait to hear your take on the finale. Do y'all think the humans are in a simulation of their lives on Earth or actually put back slash resurrected? And we just answered that. We are team simulation. Yes. Sarah, what team are you on? Let us know. All listeners. What team are you on? Are you on TS, like us, or are you on TR, Team Reality, or Team Resurrection? So we got a very lengthy message from Kate at I Do Human Things. It's not a bad thing, Kate. No, it's not a bad thing. I honestly get very excited. I'm like cheaty when he finds out he has an assignment, you know, when uh, when I see your your messages. But we are going to have to go through it a little quicker. So one of the points that you brought up. Um, that I really liked is when you said getting into who made Jen and who initially made this black and white non-medium place having system might be a bit far from reasonable discourse with the information we currently have available. But I'm certainly wondering why there are no shades of gray in this afterlife and who decided it was going to be this way. Who decided that annoying little things were going to be damnable for eternity? Because again, it stands to reason that the demons could not have been in charge of this entirely as they'd really just want anyone. The angels, on the other hand, only want the best of the best. It's like an exclusive club, which honestly seems kind of douchey. Like, maybe they should all be in the bad place, or at least they should get some human interns to help them with perspective. Super agree. Like I said, I think a couple episodes ago, I have a bit of a problem with a non-human person or entity judging humans living their lives, right? Like, Mm -hmm. you never had the human experience, so how can you really judge with, like, a proper perspective? Right. So, this system is old. Mm -hmm. I think this system is as old as life. Okay. So, I think as soon as humans started to make decisions, have conscious thought, that's when these good and bad places were created. Mm -hmm. And... I don't think the system has changed since then. And that's why it's so arbitrary. That's why it's so black and white. Because so long ago, there weren't all these moral decisions to make. There weren't all these different options. It was, I clonked this dude on the head with a club. Or I don't clonk the dude. Or I don't clonk the dude. That was it. It was either (laughs) good or bad. Don't clonk the dude, good. Good place. Clonk the dude, bad. Bad place. The system has not been changed for hundreds of thousands of years. Mm-hmm. So, that's we need my a shake up. Yeah. Human mediators. Mmm. I want that. I'm chilly. I don't know if that answered any of your questions, Kate, because I kind of forgot, but <laughs> I wanted to say it. Another comment of yours that I really liked was when you said, Either way, ending with Eleanor finding Chidi is a compelling piece of writing that keeps some of the basic tenets of this show in mind and promises they will be there in the future. Alone, people falter. Together, they prosper. Chidi and Eleanor's relationship represents exactly what a successful and healthy relationship should look like. People improving each other and growing together. And further, the show always remembers that it's important to breach out to people quite unlike yourself. I really like that. I think it's just so true to the show and so true to these characters. Like, we have four very different characters, but they all have amazing qualities and they all have bad qualities but they're able to just make each other better Mm -hmm. and they consistently have been making each other better so it's going to be really fun to see how they do that when the world is so much larger now (laughs) you threw out a bunch of questions for us kate which is great are they all in the same simulation are they all in the separate simulations how long do they have to prove themselves it must be over a year 
is it until they die? Is this then essentially a chance at redoing their entire lives? Sure, it's a false one, but what makes something real? How can we even know we're in something real? What is real? <laughs> it's like you're having your own little breakdown there, <laughs> Kate. <laughs> you're and then having you your own like, existential yeah, crisis. Yeah, exactly. It's great. Last season's finale left us with near endless amounts of theorizing to do, but I think this one might actually leave us with more, and that's a very good thought. And Yeah, I, I agree with you. That's pretty much how I feel, and um, I'm very excited to see what they have in store for us. I feel like we're definitely going to be talking about a lot of these questions when season three starts up. Mm-hmm. So thanks for giving us a head start. Yep. <laughs> Moving on to our next bit of mail. Yes, this piece of mail comes from Jazzy at Jazzy Bear. Um, I only noticed this week that it was in our requests for messages on Twitter. So I'm sorry that we did not get to this earlier. You say, so have you ever considered the possibility that it's actually Michael that's being tortured? I mean, he's the one who's been in his job for a millennia, right? And he's got his job as an architect sort of by default. What if all of that is the actual ruse? Michael slaves away uselessly for thousands of years, and after a while, the higher-ups decide to give him a new level of torture by giving him hope. But then his plans fail, fail, and fail some more. And to make it worse, he's starting to catch a little bit of the humanity bug. Ugh, can you imagine a worse torture, having having spent a life being devoid of emotion and human trappings, only to suddenly be sucked in by the most awful parts of humanity? There's nothing worse in the human experience than dashed hopes. And that's perfectly summarized, and it's very good thought, and we definitely mentioned this a couple episodes ago. Mm -hmm. So we apologize for not getting to this sooner, but we can restate our thoughts. No, I don't think it's Michael being tortured, but I think it would be a really great way to torture somebody. A double level of torture. Yeah, because now he's trying to save the humans, and to fail in that would be devastating. Right. Because he cares about them now. No, it's not just him that he cares about. It's not just his project. It's, I care about myself, sure. I care about the project, whatever. I care about these four humans now that are my friends. And I'm willing to sacrifice myself for these people. Yeah. And if I fail them... I'm not just failing my own life, I'm failing them. That's torture. Yeah. So I like the idea that it's a double layer of torture. So Mm. Eleanor and everyone, they're all real. They're all really being tortured. Yeah. But they're also torturing Michael. Ooh, okay. Yeah, that's very possible. And Sean is the one in charge with torturing Michael. Mm. So that could be fun. It's, It's fun to think about, but I don't think it's what's going on. I think they could possibly bring it up in later seasons, though. So we'll keep an eye out for that. I mean, I thought that the whole them going back to Earth thing was, like, never going to happen. Yeah, me too. So, who knows? Agreed. Yeah. Nothing is off the table. Mm-hmm. Not with this show. Last week, Darcy Carden, the actress who plays Janet, of course, had an AMA on Reddit, which is a Ask Me Anything. So she answered a bunch of questions, and we got to hear her thoughts and some interesting tidbits of the show, including... One of our own questions. Mm-hmm. So we asked Darcy Carden our pressing question that we've had pretty much since the beginning of this show. Mm-hmm. Do you think Janet is a person? And I, I and I said, if yes, did you always think of her as a person? And her response to that was, not a person. So Janet is not a person, which is what Janet always says. Yes, I mean it's. You know, it's like her catchphrase. Not a girl, not a robot, not a person. Right. Right? But. But interesting, you know, comes from uh, comes from the woman who brings Janet to life, so to speak. And, uh, and we got a Reddit user named Houndy who said, If the not a person answer is not debated needlessly to death on the next Fork and Bullshit, I will be very disappointed. <laughs> so... I mean, I don't know if it's going to be debated needlessly to death, but it will be debated. That's for sure. Because now that I'm just, I'm, I'm thinking about Janet and her journey, I really feel like her story is her journey to personhood. And it's going to take a while. Like, she's getting there. And this season, we've seen her change so much, right? 
And she says now, I'm not just a Janet. I don't know what I am, right? So she's trying to figure that out. So at the moment, I don't think she sees herself as a person. Mm -hmm. I think she might even like transcend personhood, like just go right past it and become like, I don't know, some sort of enlightened being or something. But yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. I, I almost see her in those diagrams of evolution of like the mm. little C amoebas turning into like a double cell, single celled organism evolving, getting, you know, spread in a couple legs, mm-hmm. crawling out of the water, et cetera, et cetera. Oh. So Janet started out at the end of that diagram just regular old janet and as the resets have happened she's Mm. progressing along the timeline but the timeline doesn't end like she's gonna keep going right and personhood is just one step like you said she's gonna go past that she's gonna become more interesting so janet's not gonna stop evolving yeah but i i like that that the overarching theme of the show one of them is Janet becoming a better person, a mm-hmm. better being mm-hmm. alongside Eleanor. Yeah, at least much more powerful. But also, yeah, I would argue definitely more human. And the other question that we had for Darcy was, what's one of your favorite moments from the set? And she answered, one fave memory, there are one million, but here's one. In the last episode of season one, there is a moment where Ted Danson pushes a cactus over and it falls on the ground. This was improvised, by the way. Pushing the cactus to the ground was not in the script. When Ted did that, we, the cast and the crew, lost our minds. It was late and we were giggly and loopy and feeling a little cuckoo. And Will and I, the guy who plays Cheaty, made up a great song and a great dance. And the lyrics are simple. Cactus up, cactus down. This story would be better if I could sing the song for you and show you the dance. But because I am typing this on a computer and we are not in the same room, I can't do that. But maybe someday. Will and I still sing this song to this day, and I'll actually see him tonight, and we will most certainly sing it at some point in the night. (laughs) So, Darcy, if you're listening, or even listeners, just, like... At her on Twitter and ask her to record that dance for us and the song for us. Maybe get Will involved too because I need to see it. (laughs) I want to know how the whole cactus up, cactus down thing goes. Is there like arm movements that go up and then down? You know, is it like... Bed goes up, bed goes down. Bed goes up, bed goes down. Yeah. Cactus up, cactus Cactus down. down. Cactus Cactus up, cactus cactus down. down. Is it like that? Darcy, you need to let us know. I think that's it. Next episode, we will have a season two wrap up episode. Mm -hmm. Expect it. We can't give you a definite date, but it's likely going to be in two weeks. Mm -hmm. So it'll be on our social media. It'll pop up on your podcast app. Yep. And then we'll also let you know what our plans are for the break. Mm -hmm. Or, Or if you have any ideas, let us know. Yeah, if you have any suggestions of TV shows, movies, whatever, whatever that you would like us to discuss, you know, send us a message, send us an email. We welcome all suggestions. Mm -hmm. And also, send us your thoughts on season two. We're going to be talking about it as a whole. We're going to binge watch it now that it's all out. And uh, and we want to hear all of your thoughts and your predictions for season three. Bring it on. Yep. And thank you very much for sending us cute cactus pictures. Yes, thank you. And thank you just for sending us lots of messages this season. And thank you so much for listening. Like, we wouldn't be doing this podcast if it wasn't for you guys. That's true. We wouldn't. Yeah, I mean, it's shouting into the void otherwise. Janet's void. Ooh, Shouting into the void. Yeah. I like that. (laughs) So that brings us to the end of Fork and Bullshirt, a Multiverse Radio production. If you like this show, please leave us a rating and a review on iTunes. It is the best way for others to find the show. And now that season two is over, you can tell people to listen to us. You know, if, if someone you know is watching it on Netflix, then recommend us. If you believe that they would like us. Anyway. When is it on Netflix? I don't know. 
If you want to get in touch with us, we're on Twitter at Multiverse Radio and on Facebook at Multiverse Radio Podcast. And you can always email us from our website. If you're like Kate and you like to write lengthy things, our website is multiverseradio.ca. We'll see you in a couple weeks. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye. <laughs> I'm just going to keep saying pickle party. Pickle party. Party with pickles. Putting in a barrel. Getting up. You don't put them in a barrel. You put them whatever. in a package. Okay, fine. Peter put Piker picked a pack of pickled peppers. Put it in a package. Put it in a pickle party package. <laughs>